in chapter 11. Uh, there it is, middle adulthood, chapter 11. We're going to talk about middle adulthood. This is when a lot of people get married. Uh, we, got, we have a lot of things to talk about. We have diseases to talk about, life expectancy and whatnot. So let's go ahead and get started. Middle adulthood runs from age 40 to 65. That's middle adulthood. Uh, traditionally, it may be the most uh, productive period of a person's life. Though the end of middle age probably signals retirement. Most people retire at 65. Uh, I'm 72, and that's going to come up over and over again in this discussion. So I'm beyond middle age or middle adulthood. I'm an old man. There are potentially many changes during this time period that point toward a slowing down. Ageism is uh, uh, unreasonable and irrational beliefs concerning people as they age. Uh, modern society relishes youth and uh, denigrates uh, aging. Uh, physical attractiveness is defined by youth, and people insult those who show signs of not fitting into their definitive definition of attractive. Uh, what was I reading the other day? Uh, something about Jane Seymour. Jane Seymour's in a new television show, I guess. Uh, Jane Seymour, when she turned 65, she did a Playboy spread. So she's a pretty bold lady. Um, people reaching middle age will spend tremendous amounts of money to appear younger. Uh, and I don't think that's what Jane Seymour has done. You can, you can see that she uh, just takes care of herself. Uh, a lot of people gain weight as they get older. And uh, that weight uh, tends to look uh, frumpy, make them, make them look frumpy. But of course... Uh, Jane Seymour has always kept herself in very good condition. Uh, there are reasons why the aging process is not well understood. There are many factors that uh, are tied into it inclu that include uh, life trauma. What kind of life traumas have you had? Uh, the environment that you live in, uh, the diet that you eat, uh, debts that you accrue, such as, uh, you know, you, you think when you're a kid that you can do anything that you want, and if you continue doing all those things that, uh, that people warned you about, um, then these are debts that, you're, that you, you are accruing. Uh, so the more tobacco that you smoke, the more alcohol that you drink, the more drugs that you take, uh, the shorter, potentially the shorter uh, time period that you will uh, you will live. And so this is one of the things that you need to think about when you're 21 years old. You start smoking cigarettes or you start drinking alcohol or you decide to shoot up with heroin. Or since all your friends are, are snorting cocaine, that you, you want to snort cocaine or shoot up or, you know, smoke crystal meth, whatever. And of course, a lot of this has to do with genetics. So uh, this is a woman um, uh, who is uh, who, at 15. This is what she looked like. And this is what she looked like at 48. And as you can see, she aged markedly. Uh, while other people can, can look fairly young into their, uh, into their 60s and 70s. My wife uh, looks fairly young, uh, despite the fact that she is uh, 70 years old. Let me see if I... Oh, that's it. Okay. Uh, so it's the environment you live in. This is a picture of uh, where I used to live in Montana. Uh, up near the Canadian border. Uh, this is a picture in the wintertime, so it's pretty bleak uh, in the wintertime. You certainly don't want to get caught on any of, uh, on this road uh, at night, especially, or during the day if it's, uh, if it's uh, negative digits. And of course, in that portion of Montana, it's very frequently that cold. So people who live in that environment learn to live in that environment. You have to you have to wear the right clothes. You have to prepare yourself. Uh, you can't go out and, and just drive. Uh, your car might break down. Uh, in Montana, uh, you have to plug your car in at night uh, to keep the oil from freezing. Uh, so that's one of the things that people do in Montana that you probably don't have to do in Arizona. I know your, your temperature gets down fairly cold uh, but theirs is uh, fairly cold for an extended length of time. And cars do freeze up. Oil turns into molasses, uh, and you can't get your car started um, if it's uh, too thick. And that has been a problem. Uh, so the car that we came back uh, to um, 
uh, we came to, to Iowa, uh, the car that we had uh, had a, a plug in it so that we could plug it in at night. And of course, it's the diet you, you eat. Uh, this is not a child wearing a fat suit. That's actually his rolls of fat. Uh, so it all depends. Uh, life events uh, that you might be going through, the traumas that you might be going through. These are immigrants uh, coming from uh, the Middle East, uh, trying to escape from uh, the, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Syria, uh, escape from ISIS. Uh, they're from uh, North Africa, uh, where things are in turmoil and it is pretty, pretty bad. Well, anyway, so if you had to go through this, of course, that might make you age a little bit more and of course you get to do whatever you want to to do to yourself and this is an individual who is that's a mirror in her lap okay she's trying to she's trying to hit this vein right here and she missed it and there's another vein right there that she kind of messed up uh anyway uh yeah you can do that to yourself if you like and uh evidently she wants to Life expectancy is the statistical figure as to how long an individual can expect to live. It is actually a statistical average of how long people do live. Every country has its own life expectancy. Third world countries tend to have significantly lower life expectancies than industrialized countries. The countries with the lowest life expectancies are all African countries. Malawi only has a life expectancy of 37.6. Mozambique 37.5, and Zambia 37.2. So as you can see, uh, if you lived in any of those three uh, uh, African countries, then potentially you wouldn't make age 40. The three countries in the world with the highest life expectancy are Japan at 80.7, Andorra with 83.5, and San Marino at 81.1. Now, if you know if you know anything about geography, you know that Andorra uh, is about the size of, uh, geez, uh, <laughs> it's about half the size of uh, the county that you live in, wherever you live, in Arizona or New Mexico. And San Marino is actually a tiny little place as well. Um, oh, they're both in the Pyrenees Mountains of Europe. Andorra, Andorra has only 68,000 citizen, citizens, and San Marino only has 27,000 citizens. Flagstaff, of course, has 72,402 people, and Gallup has 21,854. So each country is about the size of Flagstaff and Gallup. Life expectancy in the United States is 76.5. Actually, uh, the life expectancy in 2000 printed uh, in 2009, it was 78.9. But uh, this is life expectancy at, at uh, 2010 was 76.5. Uh, and it's, it crawls up uh, as, as people, you know, we develop new medicines and whatnot. However, over the last two years, since COVID hit, uh, our life expectancy has actually gone down to 76.6. Now, the thing to remember is that um, in 2019, it was 78.9. And in 2021, it was it was 76.6. So it went down 2.3 years in, uh, in, just, uh, in just two years. Uh, and that was during the pandemic. So one of the things that you have to think about is that if you were listening to the news and uh, you were listening to some of the news anyway, on some of the channels, they were saying that it was uh, that uh, COVID was a hoax, uh, that it, it uh, didn't really happen. We didn't really need um, we didn't really need the vaccinations. Uh, people are still arguing that they don't need the vaccinations, despite all of the proof that uh, if you got the vaccinations that uh, the probability of you having a, a serious uh, reaction to, to COVID-19 uh, declines. Uh, they still, you know, these people still argue the same thing. Uh, well, here are the statistics that just because of COVID-19 uh, that uh, life expectancy in the United States went down 2.3 years. Now, uh, 2.3 years doesn't sound like a very long time, but the reality is when 
you're close to not being here anymore. 2.3 years sounds like a really long time. <laughs> if I could tell you, well, you have a choice. You can either die today or you can you could have died um, uh, back in uh, 2019. Um, you know, sometime in February or March, uh, you know, would you take it? And you'd have, you'd probably say, no, let, let me live that 2.3 years. That was, I, I'd sure like to live that 2.3 years, even if it was during a pandemic. Heart disease has been cut in half in the last 30 years. Death uh, during childbirth is rare. Uh, whereas at the turn of the century, uh, that was fairly common. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, a child had a one in three chance of living to the age of 10. So we were losing a lot of children. And that's, of course, what the vaccinations are all about. Vaccinations have, the childhood illnesses have reduced the number of, of children that aren't making it to their 10th, uh, 10th birthday. Being female, female is a factor in longevity. 58% of people over 65 and 70% of the people over 85 are female. And of course, like I said, I'm 72. I'm planning on being one of that 30% who are males that are over age 85. But we'll see what happens. You'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll all see what happens. While life expectancy is a theoretical speculative number, longevity is actually the length of time an individual lives. One of the things that you need to remember is, uh, one of the things you need to think about is that uh, when you were born, your life expectancy wasn't 76.6. It was probably lower than that. Somewhere in the 72s, 70 to 72 or something like that. When I was born, I was born in 1949, and when I was born, my life expectancy was 59 years. Um, that was what, uh, 10, that was a decade ago. That was 13 years ago. Uh, so when I was born, I was only expected to, to live, uh, to be 59 years old. The reason is because in, in 1949, there were a lot of people that smoked cigarettes. Um, they didn't understand the cholesterol caused uh, heart disease. Um, so people's diets were full of lots of fat. I can remember my dad's favorite breakfast was uh, bacon and eggs. And he had that for breakfast almost every day. Well, my dad lived to be 90 years old, which was pretty good for somebody who ate bacon and eggs for breakfast every morning. He, he also drank a lot of coffee. Uh, but uh, and, and coffee's not bad for you. But uh, bacon and eggs, you know, you eat it every day. That's that's too much. Germans have a saying that uh, women can eat all the eggs that they want, but men should only have one egg a week, uh, which is has has to do with uh, with heart disease and whatnot. Uh, but that's an old German saying uh, that I learned when I was in Germany. Uh, so things have changed. We've we've figured things out, um, and 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 all of this stuff changes over time, and and it is just a speculative number. Uh, but of course, people were the average uh, age that people were making it to was only 59 years. Now, for some reason, I obsessed on well, not really obsessed, but I was really interested in the obituary column. <laughs> so I used to I used to look to see how old people made it. I was thinking, how how far can I go? And uh, anyway, I used to I was used to read the uh, obituaries, and the interesting thing about the old obituaries is they used to tell you how wh how and why people died. Uh, he died in an automobile accident. He, he died of heart disease. He had cancer at forty nine. You know these kinds of things. And of course, when people were smoking a lot more, then uh, uh, seeing people die of of heart disease in their fifties uh, or even in their forties was not that uncommon. Uh, seeing people die of cancer uh, in their 40s and 50s wasn't that uncommon uh, because, you know, you put toxins into your system and that's going to make a mess. Um, I was talking to uh, my barber up in Montana and she was saying that, uh, that uh, marijuana w wasn't real popular in Montana and then it all suddenly came uh, to Montana in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, like it did in, in most places in the United States. And there were five guys, five guys that were co the cool guys, and they were the ones that, uh, that uh, really smoked a lot of pot. And they made this their life mission was to, to smoke 
marijuana every day. Anyway, uh, so they were my age at that time. When I was in Montana, I was, what, 50 through 60? Uh, and she said uh, all of them were in were my age, uh, but only f oh, there was only one that was still alive. The other four had died. And the other four, uh, three of them had died of cancer, and one of them had died in an automobile accident. But three of them had died of these, this real, these really strange cancers. So, you know, you just never know what people are going to do to themselves. Marijuana is not a, is, you know, people are thinking, gee, gee dude, I'll, I'll get stoned today and it won't hurt me tomorrow. But the reality is that uh, everything, uh, everything can hurt you if you use it too frequently. Many people desire longevity, but most fear extended chronological age age, and that's the actual number of years, and decrepitude. Decrepitude is the inability to function on one's own. Nobody wants to be decrepit. Uh, biological age is a physical age of the body in comparison to the chronological age. And, you know, I used to brag about, geez, I'm, I'm in my 70s and, and I'm, I'm still running, but uh, this morning my hip started hurting, so I'm wondering if I'm getting arthritis in my hip. Anyway, <laughs> I, I did exercise this morning, and I am going to go. I am going to go lift weights uh, as soon as I finish this uh, this lecture. Uh, the longest uh, recorded lives have been in the the 120 year range. You know, I looked this up uh, when I was going through this lecture. I, I thought, well, who's the oldest person that we've ever known? And of course, eh, that's really hard to tell. But there was a um, uh, an Anishinaabe uh, chief uh, up in uh, Minnesota. Uh, who, who we're, we're pretty sure he lived to be 138, uh, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a toss-up. 138 is a pretty long time. Uh, he looked a lot like this. Of course, he wasn't a female. This is a female. But uh, he uh, was pretty wrinkly. Many gerontologists, literally old man studier, uh, feel that 110 to 120 years is a upper limit of human genetic endurance. However, with advancing medical research and less and less traumatic lives, other scientists are predicting longer and longer lives. Many scientists see no reason to place a fixed limit on longevity, and I agree with them, and my plan is to live into my hundreds. As a matter of fact, my wife and I are planning on me living into my hundreds, um, and, uh, that's one of the reasons why I didn't start taking social security until I was 70 years old, uh, so that I would get as much social security as I possibly could. So that's our plan anyway, is for me to live a long time. And I have longevity in my, in my family. I have, I have relatives that have lived into, to, to be close to 100. My mom was 98 when she died. Uh, she was in her 99th year. Uh, my dad was 90 when he died. So, you know, there's, I, 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 can, I can live for another 20 years easily. Uh, it's, it's there. We'll see how I do. Uh, what people look like tends to be genetically dictated. Thus, people from one group may look old at 30, while another group maintains their skin elasticity and hair pigmentation into their 60s and 70s. I had a friend up in Montana. Um, he was Grovant, uh, and uh, <laughs> he and I had been born about two weeks apart. Gerald was his name, or is his name. He's still alive. Uh, but here I am, I, you know, you, you guys have probably never seen me. I don't put my picture up anyplace. But my hair is really white. And it's been white for, I don't know, uh, since I was in my 50s. Uh, but here's Gerald. He's, you know, we're in, our, uh, we're in our 60s. Here we are in our 60s. Gerald doesn't have the first white hair. And he's got no wrinkles. And I'm just kind of, I'm starting to wrinkle up. I'm wrinkling up pretty good anyway. And Gerald doesn't, he doesn't exercise. Uh, but here he is. He's got... He's got uh, pitch black hair and, and uh, looks like he's in his 30s. Kind of irritating. Uh, young adults uh, tend to have smooth, taut skin and their hair has color, fullness, and sheen. Today's 20-year-olds are taller than their parents and they tend to reach sexual maturity earlier than in past generations. This uh, trend is believed to be due to improved nourishment, health care, and less physically stressful lives. 
Uh, and of course, that has a lot to do with why we are living longer as well. Most young adults tend to be quite appearance conscious. Uh, they tend to maintain a slim, lean physique and wear clothes that accentuate this aspect of their appearance. Uh, these are tights, and uh, by, they, they used to call them yoga tights, I think. Anyway, everybody's wearing them all the time now. You know, all of a sudden, people are wearing these yoga tights all over the place. It's a little, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting because uh, the um, uh, fashion, the style before was really loose fitting clothes. Um, and my uh, wife was noticing that uh, basketball shorts have gotten shorter. Um, I, I can remember when, uh, if you look at <laughs> any, any uh, basketball games from when Larry Bird was playing basketball, you know, they were these short shorts. And that was the style. I mean, everybody had those short, wore those short shorts. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the uh, University of Michigan uh, made a run all the way to the final uh, NCAA final tournament. And they wore these really long uh, shorts that went uh, just below their knee. And, of course, they got baggier and baggier, and then they started. And now they have started uh, getting smaller and smaller. And, of course, you don't think about this. I don't think about this when I put on a pair of shorts to go to the gym. But, uh, you know, sometimes I'm probably way out of style because I, I my shorts are too big or too small or too tight or too loose, who knows. As individuals approach middle age, their appearance tends to change. Skin elasticity decreases and facial expressions begin to mold people's faces into character lines. Both men and women uh, begin to suffer from middle age spread, men tending to take on a spare tire and women to grow larger thighs. And that's what this is all about. Here she is as a child and now all of a sudden Pop, she's middle age. Okay, this is a middle age spread. Uh, obviously, these guys drink a little bit more beer than they need to, and they don't exercise. You can tell they have no, uh, uh, they have no firm muscles any place. You can see their arm muscles are really kind of weak. Of course, their pecs are. They don't have pecs, I guess. But here's their abdominal muscles. Uh, muscles. Uh, fat replaces muscle, of course, and this is uh, one of the reasons why my, my sister didn't want to gain any muscle. She was afraid it would turn to fat because she was fairly sedentary all of her life. Uh, by late adulthood, physical changes become more obvious. Skin loses some of its color, uh, hence the desire for tan skin among Europeans, and becomes splotchier. And of course, as it turns out, if you're a European and you have pale skin, one of the things that happens is that all of a sudden you've got freckles uh, and you've got uh, age spots. Actually, they're age spots. And the more you are out in the sun, the more age spots you have. And I've got them all over my face. I played a lot of softball even as I got older and I, I didn't mind tanning. And now, of course, I'm going to pay for it because I've got these dark spots on my face that may not look very attractive. Uh, varicose veins uh, may form in, in your legs. Uh, hair may turn white and thin, and my hair has turned white and it is thin. I got a bald spot on top of my head. I don't ever look at it. Uh, I didn't even know it was there until somebody took a picture of me from the side. Uh, my niece took a picture of me from the side, and I looked like I had a bald head. <laughs> the top of my head was bald, and I went, wait a minute, that's not true. And then I got a mirror, and I looked in, in, you know, in, at the back of my head. And I realized, my goodness, I do have a bald spot on top of my head. It's my, my niece's fault. She took that damn picture, I guess. Hair may begin sprouting in odd places. Uh, you're, I, I, I pull hair out of my ears all the time, uh, as weird as that may sound. Uh, the hair in your nose starts growing long. It's just the biz most bizarre thing in the world. Uh, it has to do with hormones. Uh, and, and women start getting chin hairs, as weird as that may seem. Individuals may begin using plastic surgery, heavier cosmetics, or Botox to rid themselves of age lines. I saw an advertisement for Botox on, on television the other day, and I was thinking, well, I'm not going to tell you what I was thinking, but I was thinking, well, that doesn't seem necessary to me. Uh, but I don't mind 
you know, I don't mind looking my age. I've never looked my age. When I was uh, in my 30s, I looked like I was 12. Uh, I think I told you the story that when I started teaching uh, high school, uh, after I got out of the service, got out of the service in 83. In 1983, I was 34 years old. I was 34 years old, and I looked like I was a junior high student. I had to grow a mustache in order to, to, uh, to keep people from thinking I was one of the junior high kids. Um, people may deny their age and seek symbols of youth. Uh, they may take on younger lovers, as stupid as that sounds. Structural and functional changes, your joints. Uh, the joints are protected by a smooth protective cushion of cartilage called the meniscus. With age and uh, use, the cartilage deteriorates and the smooth surface becomes pitted. And of course, this can lead to arthritis. And that's what I'm afraid is happening in my hip uh, because after I exercise, it hurts. And I have a hard time walking. <clears throat> I'm okay before while I'm I'm exercising and before I exercise, but I but it's starting to hurt after I ex exercise. And smart guy that I am, I'm headed to the gym after I finish this lecture. <laughs> bones, uh, the bones become less dense, especially in women uh, who have menstrual and partum. Uh, partum means birth uh, drains on the calcium supply that may leave the bones brittle and porous. And one of the things, and this is a, one of the reasons why you need to take your vitamins if you're, if, when you're pregnant, uh, because when you're pregnant, uh, that baby's going to get all the calcium it needs. And if it has to suck the calcium out of your bones, that's exactly what it will do. Uh, for this reason, the Germans, uh, you know, I told you about what the Germans said about eggs. What the Germans say about women is that uh, you lose a tooth for every child that you have. So you lose a t tooth out of your mouth. And what they're talking about is the calcium and the enamel and whatnot. whatnot. But it's the minerals that you're losing that you lose, uh, that, and that's why you lose um, a tooth. So it has to do with how many babies you've had. Um, calcium is constantly being replaced, but in women, bone density loss begins uh, to occur in their 30s. Um, male calcium loss in the bones doesn't begin until they, they are in their 60s, uh, so they don't really need to worry about it. Um, I've had problems with calcium in, in, my, uh, in my history, my medical history. Um, I had kidney stones when I was 28 years old, and I've had kidney stones every time I got stupid and started... Uh, consuming more dairy products. Uh, for a while I was eating yogurt for, for lunch. I thought it was great, you know, mix it with a little bit of cereal and, and it's, it's really good. Uh, and of course I had kidney stones. Uh, I was eating cheese for a while. Uh, it was about the only thing that I liked in, in when I was, my wife was stationed in Japan and by golly, I had kidney stones again. Anyway, so you gotta be careful. Uh, Europeans seem to have more problems with uh, osteoporosis than anyone else. Um, I think, am I going to talk about it? Uh, let me get through this and then I'll tell you about it. Estrogen plays an important role in keeping blood calcium levels normal. In women, the estrogen uh, promotes the absorption of calcium from the blood and into the bone. When estrogen levels fall during uh, menopause, Women no longer have the protection of estrogen to protect their bone mass. And for that reason, we get, instead of having this, we get this. And this can get really severe. The most vulnerable uh, bones uh, to the female is the hip bone. A woman over 65 has a 1 in 5 chance of breaking her hip. Large bone fractures take uh, much longer for an older individual to recover from than a younger individual. Uh, and about half of the women who break their hips die within a year. That is a statistic uh, that's been around for a really long time. And this is the reason why. It just can't knit properly. And since you can't move, all of a sudden sedentary uh, diseases start setting in. Diseases from being, uh, from laying down or being, you know, sedentary all the time. And you get heart disease, and you get uh, diabetes, and 
and your heart becomes flabby. Um, real serious problem. You got to force yourself to get out of bed, and uh, if you have a broken hip, uh, as soon as you possibly can. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're not going to be around for very much longer. That's just the way it works. Osteoporosis or porous bones is a disorder of old age where the bones become thin and brittle because of calcium depletion. One out of four women in the United States suffer from this problem, from osteoporosis. Uh, one in five of women uh, over 65 will break their hip. One in four women suffer from this. Uh, so what's going on here? Why are these two statistics different? Well, the reason they're different is because some women do something about it. They do whatever they can. Uh, the reality is you can force calcium into your, into your long bones, into your body, the areas that normally uh, wear out. Uh, you can do that by, by exercising. And some women do that. And that's one of the reasons why these two statistics are just a little bit different. It is estimated that 1.3 million fractures a year in the United States are the result of osteoporosis. The spine is especially susceptible to the problem and is characterized by the classic hunchback posture. And this is what osteoporosis looks like. This is what a woman looks like when her before osteoporosis sets in and now she's got deterioration of her vertebral support and that causes the hunchback. Osteoporosis is more prevalent in white females and more pronounced in women of fair skin and small statures. Uh, proper uh, nutrition and exercise that begins in youth and is followed throughout life can help prevent osteoporosis. Smoking can exacerbate the problem in that it ties, uh, ties up uh, vitamin D uh, that is needed for proper uh, function of calcium. Now, my mother was only four foot eight, a uh, short little thing. Uh, and she was fairly slender when she was younger. Uh, and her other problem was that she had uh, reddish brown hair. So she had very fair skin, uh, freckled. She was real freckled. So she was susceptible to osteoporosis, but she never developed osteoporosis because she exercised. She always did physical things. While other people were just sitting around uh, doing nothing. She was she was out pu pulling weeds and, and doing things. And she, she did this into her 90s, and, and she was able to fight off osteoporosis, even though osteoporosis should have been something that she should have, that potentially she could have uh, had a problem with. She never smoked. Uh, she didn't drink. Uh, she drank a little bit uh, when she got older, but she didn't drink very much at all. Uh, and she lived to a, to a ripe old age of 98, which is not bad. Uh, arthritis. Arthritis is a general term that uh, refers to inflammation of the joints. Arthritis is common in older individuals, but it can be found in younger people as well. Nearly half the people over 65 suffer from some form of arthritis. And I have arthritis in my, my shoulder, my right shoulder. It's why I can't do all my exercises uh, I can't do lat pull downs, for example. I have to protect my shoulder. <clears throat> uh, and I may have arthritis. As I said, I may have arthritis in my hip. It's starting to hurt. And my right knee is, is bad. Now, the weird thing is that I don't have an ACL in my left knee. Um, I lost it in a softball game. Ugh. And uh, But I don't have any problems with my left knee. It's my right knee that hurts when I go up and down the stairs. I'm laughing, but it's not that funny. Osteoporosis or osteoarthritis is the most common type of arthritis in the aging. Osteoarthritis represents inflammation and swelling in the joints. It is also common for this problem to be present when the joints begin to de degenerate. And this is what it looks like. This is what osteoarthritis looks like when you're looking at the joints. And the reason that this knuckle is big, even though the knuckle's almost gone, is because the body, in order to protect that joint or, or whatever's left of that joint, it will swell up uh, to, uh, to take care of that. All the swelling allows the uh, hand to stay intact. Otherwise, uh, the, you know, that, this thing would fall apart. This mess would fall apart. But because of all the swelling, that, that allows the uh, joint to stay together. 
Rheumatoid arthritis is a crippling disease that progressively destroys joint tissue. 70% of the cases appear between the ages of 25 and 70. It affects 75% more women than men. Uh, cartilage becomes damaged and the joints become deformed, sometimes fusing together. And rheumatoid arthritis, uh, am I going to say this? No. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. Uh, we, we, now that, we know that now. A lot of arthritis actually is an autoimmune disease. Uh, women get autoimmune diseases more than men do. Uh, and the reason is because your women have a, a better uh, immune system. Uh, but sometimes the immune system gets a little, goes a little crazy in select individuals, and it will cause an it will cause an autoimmune problem in that select individual. Uh, autoimmune diseases are aren't that uh, uncommon. Uh, arthritis, of course, very frequently arthritis will be actually be uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And it, uh, it is an autoimmune disease. There's a lot of other autoimmune diseases. Uh, and we're discovering more and more all the time. Uh, we're discovering that some conditions that people have are actually autoimmune diseases. Uh, my dad had psoriasis. Psoriasis is an autoimmune disease. Uh, as is, uh, there, uh, there's another skin disease. I can't think of it. Anyway, there's a lot of autoimmune diseases out there. You can look at a list of them. You can Google autoimmune disease, and you can see all these things. I have two nieces uh, who have autoimmune diseases. Um, uh, one of them affects her liver, uh, and the other one affects her immune system. Um, one, But both of them, and of course, while they were growing up, we kept telling them, look, you need to do, you, you need to, to eat uh, a healthy diet. Uh, when they were young, they were very picky eaters. Both these kids were really picky eaters, and they would only eat, I think I told you about this, uh, they would only eat uh, french fries, uh, cheese pizza, um, breakfast sausage, and drink Coke. They wouldn't drink milk, uh, They and that's all they, they consumed. Uh, so... <laughs> My 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 sister used to have to carry around a deep fat fryer so she could make them French fries that they liked. And I, of course, there were only certain French fries that they would eat. Uh, as stupid as that sounds, so you could never take them any place uh, because unless they had breakfast sausage, cheese pizza, or or the French fries that they liked, they would they wouldn't eat it. Uh, and they just drank Coca Cola. And now, of course, both of them. Are in the, they're in their 40s and they are uh, they have come down with autoimmune diseases so you know you can really screw yourself up if you're if you're too uh, bullheaded I guess anyway I, I should feel sorry for them but I don't because I kept telling my sister that she needed she, they needed a more diverse diet and my mother told them my mother was a nurse. And she kept telling her that she needed to uh, force those kids to to eat other foods, but they they'd throw it up. I mean, they were they were pretty spoiled. Anyway, we that's enough of my crazy family. Most people detect uh, little effect of aging on their sensory motor systems until they reach about the age of fifty. At that point, hearing losses uh, become more obvious. Uh, presbycusis, uh, that's a hearing loss due to age. Pre presby means uh, old, old ears. Uh, the lens loses its flexibility, causing presbyopia, old eyes. Presbyopia is usually in the form of farsightedness and may require reading glasses, and that's what I, I have to use, reading glasses. I've been wearing reading glasses for about, let's see, when did I start wearing reading glasses? Uh, about 2000. Uh, I guess I was 51. There you go, 51. As the individual ages, it becomes more likely that a disease will cause excess pressure in the eyeball, damaging the optic nerve. This is a condition known as glaucoma. And of course, if uh, that's not taken care of, the it will rupture the optic nerve. It will rupture the area around the optic nerve, and the individual will go blind. So you need to treat glaucoma. As people reach middle age, uh, many of their senses begin to decline. Uh, besides presbyopia, 
Uh, some individuals may suffer from a yellowing of the lens, which filters out green, blue, and violet lights, making color acuity poor. If the lens clouds and becomes opaque, cataracts will form, making vision blurry and out of focus. 1.3 million cataract operations are performed in the United States every year. Older individuals will require more light because of pupil problems. And of course, I keep complaining that the lights aren't bright enough anymore. I can't see anything. And uh, that's my problem. Um, cataract surgery is now done with lasers. Uh, and it's, uh, it's painless. Uh, once upon a time, laser surgery wasn't that simple. They had to use a scalpel to get it out. Uh, so people would, uh, they would have laser surgery and then they would have to keep their heads still, com completely still for 24 hours, which is not the easiest thing in the world. We move our heads around a lot. So what they would do, they would lock, they would lay them down on a bed and they would lock their head uh, in a, in a vice-like structure in order to keep them from moving from side to side or moving their eyeball. That's what they were afraid that they would do. I mean, they had made a cut in the eyeball. Now, the interesting thing about an eye, about your eye, uh, it's covered with, with, uh, with mucous membrane and it will heal in about 24 hours. And that's exactly what was going on. It was, when it was raw, if they had moved their head too much, of course, they could have created an abscess. Uh, but, uh, by keeping their heads still, they were able to uh, to heal. As people drift into middle adulthood, the sins of their past often will catch up with them. If they have not maintained a healthy diet or maintained a frequent exercise regimen, these practices may haunt them in middle age as damage to their cardiovascular system. Arthro arth arthro atherosclerosis is the buildup of plaque in the walls of the arteries, that may block or slow down uh, blood flow from, with, uh, from a fatty diet. Arteriosclerosis, which is what I was trying to say before. <laughs> Atherosclerosis is a buildup of plaque. Uh, arteriosclerosis is a loss of elasticity due to the hardening of the arteries from lack of exercise. So you have atherosclerosis uh, due to uh, fat buildup, and you have arteriosclerosis due to the uh, loss of elasticity of your blood vessels. Because of athero and arteriosclerosis, blood pressure is raised. Uh, blood pressure naturally increases with age, but genetics in these conditions can lead uh, to chronically elevated blood pressure or, or hypertension. Uh, this can lead to kidney disease, heart attack, or stroke. And this is what a stroke looks like. Uh, hypertension can usually be controlled through improved diet, exercise, or medication. And I exercise and I am on medication, blood pressure medication. The system that tends to slow the least, uh, show the least wear and tear from aging is your digestive system. However, as an individual enters middle adulthood, Digestive problems can arise. Uh, you can develop ulcerative colitis, uh, absorption problems leading to poor nutrition, uh, gallstones, uh, ulcers in the stomach, ulcers in the duodenum, uh, hemorrhoids in the rectum and anus. This is a duodenal ulcer. It's right below the du duodenum is right below the uh, your stomach. And as you can see, there's an abscess. There's an ulcer right there. And this is a gastric ulcer. This is one that's in your, in your stomach. Another digestive problem that tends to occur during middle adulthood is type 2 diabetes, where the cells of the body become insensitive to the body's insulin. Type 2 diabetes becomes a problem with people who carry their fat in their gut and lean uh, toward obesity. There's also a genetic component to this problem and is seen in select populations, especially American Indians. And type 2 diabetes, uh, these are the uh, uh, symptom risk factors, uh, being over 45, being obese, uh, being physically inactive. If you, if you have a baby, a lot of times it will, uh, you'll have gestational uh, diabetes. 
that will go away, but you'll always be borderline diabetic. And of course, if you have uh, diabetes in your family, and I was just talking about prediabetes, if you have high cholesterol and, and high blood pressure, that's another risk factor for diabetes. Got to be careful. One of the most significant aspects of a female's life is her menstrual cycle. For 40 years, a woman's monthly cycle floods and depletes her system of hormones, controlling her reproductive capacity, and in some cases, controlling her moods and affecting her behavior markedly. During ovulation, when intercourse is most likely uh, to produce a pregnancy, a woman's sight, hearing, and sense of smell are the most acute. During menstruation, all of these senses are the most dulled. Menopause takes place when a woman per permanently stops ovulating and menstruating. Menopause usually occurs about a year after the woman's last period. Often women will ease into menopause over a number of years when their monthly cycle begins to become erratic. This is known as perimenopause. Uh, the process begins about age 30 when a woman's production of ova begins to decline. As a woman approaches her 50th birthday, she begins producing less and less estrogen. Menopause occurs when the ovaries no longer produce enough estrogen to sustain full menstrual cycles. In 80% of women, menopause occurs sometime between age 45 and 55. 75% of women experience little or no physical discomfort due to menopause. The most common symptom is known as hot flashes. Sorry, I needed a drink. <clears throat> sudden uh, hot, fla hot flashes are sudden contractions of blood vessels causing blood to flow to the surface of the skin, and she, all, she feels hot. Some women have uh, hot flashes constantly, while others have none at all. Other symptoms of menopause include vaginal dryness, vaginal burning, vaginal itching, urinary problems, vaginal infections. Uh, all of these things were taken care of by estrogen before, and as your estrogen declines or it decreases, uh, then these problems uh, suddenly uh, become, become a problem because your estrogen has been taking care of all of this before. Menopause causes the vagina to become shorter and narrower, and the walls become thinner and less elastic. Lubrication diminishes, uh, which may uh, cause discomfort during intercourse or irritation to the bladder. Vaginal secretions. Did I use the same picture twice? Did I? Yep, there she is. Oh, I got her twice. Okay. Uh, vaginal secretions become less acidic uh, since the acidity of the vagina protects the woman from bacterial and yeast infections. She becomes more susceptible to infection. Oddly, the more sexually active a woman is, the less drastic the changes in her vagina during menopause. Other symptoms of menopause include joint pain, muscle pain, headaches, insomnia, fatigue, dizziness, weight gain, and constipation. Since the hormones that control menopause are estrogens and sexual desire is controlled by testosterone, menopause does not decrease sexual desire. However, when vaginal changes create discomfort during intercourse, or the woman suffers from other interfering health problems, menopause may mean a decline in intercourse. Some women may uh, go through a sexual adjustment where physical responses aren't as extreme as they had been before. In the male, testosterone begins to decrease beginning in the late teens. By the age of 70, testosterone reduction has reached between 30 and 40%. The lower testosterone and other sexual problems may lead to an, an old age of impotence. The prostate gland may swell and make urination difficult and erection incomplete. As males wander into their 50s, they may begin to feel their physical decline and waning testosterone levels. They may experience depression, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, fatigue, Weakness, lower sex drive, erectile failure, memory loss, reduced muscle and bone mass, and body hair, increased body hair. 
Many men, as they age, greatly fear the loss of their sexual potency. It isn't true that as males age, they naturally lose their sexual functioning. This is basically a cultural idea. So, you know, that's just the way it is. Very often the lessening of sexual activity is due to non-physiological uh, reasons, monotony in a relationship, preoccupation to business or financial worries, mental or physical fatigue, depression, failure to make sex a high priority, fear or inability to per perform. Physiological uh, problems include diabetes, alcohol, and medication. Male sperm count begins to decline when a male is in his late 40s or early 50s. Erections tend to become slower and less firm. Orgasms less frequent. Ejaculations less forceful. It takes longer to recover and ejaculate again. And this is all known as male climacteric. 39% uh, of 40-year-old uh, 40, 40, men experience some sexual dysfunction. 5% of men in their 40s are unable to get and hold an erection. 67% of males over 70 experience some sexual dysfunction. And 15% are completely impotent. Erectile dysfunction may be caused by diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, kidney failure, depression, neurological disorders, alcohol, drugs, smoking, poor sexual techniques, unsatisfying relationships. Aging does not have to spell the doom of a couple's sex life. With many couples, menopause is liberating since the couple no longer has to worry about unwanted pregnancy as a result. The bottom line is that age has nothing to do with sexual drive and desire. Sexual expression may change its focus as a person ages, but couples are able to have sex as frequently as they want to have it. In many families, oh, okay, so that, I'm not going to talk about sex anymore. I promise I won't talk about sex anymore. In many families, middle-aged mothers uh, tend to have the role of kin keepers the person who gathers people together for celebrations and keeps them in touch with one another. And this was the job of my mother and my father. My, my dad wanted all this to happen, but my mother was the one that had to, to get it done. Sometimes middle-aged uh, parents are referred to as the sandwich generation because they are sandwiched in between aging parents and difficult adolescent children of their own. During middle adulthood, successful adults are able to maintain their mental capacities by adapting to their circumstance through selection, optimization, and compensation, or SOC. They are selective as to what they do. They optimize their abilities. They compensate when necessary. By using SOC, the individual is able to maintain their level of competence, regulate their losses by reorganizing their functions, and growing through adaptation. And we see this in sports all the time. Uh, people retiring, uh, usually in their 40s. Uh, some people will can go on and into their 50s. Position player in baseball probably retires someplace in their 40s. Uh, but a pitcher, sometimes they can pitch into their, into their 50s uh, if they want to, if they have the desire. By focusing on what they are good at, middle-aged individuals are able to develop expertise, extensive experience, knowledge, and understanding of a specific area of interest. That's what the definition of expertise is. The antithesis of expertise is a novice, someone with very little experience, knowledge, and understanding of a specific area of interest. People with expertise may have a wealth of knowledge in an area, but will only use a small amount of that knowledge in any one situation, an aspect referred to as conditionalized knowledge. Even experts have different levels of competence. Individuals who have expertise that is basically routine are referred to as merely skilled experts. These experts who can not only answer routine questions about their subject, but have such extensive knowledge that they have adaptability, flexibility, and creativity are referred to as highly competent experts. Highly competent experts become problem solvers in their field and can create strategies to expand 
their knowledge and develop new skills. This is known as adaptive expertise. Working memory is a kind of notepad in the mind for storing information in the short term so that you can be so that it can be dealt with. In fact, working memory used to be referred to as short-term memory. Working memory only holds from five to nine chunks of information at any one time. Working memory can be enhanced if the individual arranges the information in larger chunks. Still, the working memory can only hold information for about 30 seconds before it begins to decay and possibly distort. Another enhancement tool that is frequently used is rehearsal, where the individual re-enters the information into the working memory by repeating the information. Researchers feel that as we age, the capacity of our working memory tends to shrink. <clears throat> Shrinkage tends to have a great deal to do with the complexity of the task required and the technique used in memory enhancement. If the individual is using rehearsal as their memory technique, they tend to show very little decline. Any information that requires more sophisticated memory enhancement tools, such as reorganization, elaboration, or mental manipulation, there is, great, there is greater decline. Some researchers feel that as a person ages, they lose attentional resources. They have less ability to maintain their attention on a select item. However, other researchers uh, cite motivational lapses that might preclude an, an older individual from trying too hard on such nonsense. Scientists have, have recently been researching, <clears throat> and, and this is my own, uh, sorry about that, but this is my... <laughs> On feeling about researchers. <laughs> if you're seven, if you're in your 70s and they're giving you a list of words to remember, you know, this seems like a real big pile of crap. You know, why in the world would you do it if you're if you're an older person? Why would you put up with this stuff? And that's the question that I always ask when I read somebody's research. You know, you got this 21-year-old and they're real excited about their research. But the reality is, you know, I'm 70 two years old, why in the world would I do this crap? Scientists have recently been researching how select information is processed. Explicit memory is conscious or intentional recollection. Re recollection. Most often facts, names, events, or other things that people can state or declare. <clears throat> Implicit memory is memory that occurs without conscious awareness. Most often, skills and habits, throwing a ball or riding a bike, brain scans of people recalling implicit memory shows that there is a uh, specific memory pathway that takes place when recalling this information. What was I watching? I was watching a movie the other night. I watched a movie called The Atom Project. It had, uh, and it had these three guys throw, throwing a ball back and forth uh, to e each other. One was Ma uh, Mark R Ruffalo. One was... Uh, was uh, Ryan Reynolds, and the other was this kid that was supposed to be Ryan Reynolds as a as a as a twelve year old. Anyway, Ryan Reynolds had had pretty good form. I played a lot of ball in my time, and he had pretty good form. And the kid threw okay. He did he did okay. But Mark Ruffalo looked so awkward when he was throwing the ball. And theoretically, <clears throat> according to the storyline. Mark Ruffalo used to play catch with his son every night. He used to make time to go out and play catch with his son every night. And I was thinking as I watched Mark Ruffalo throwing the ball so awkwardly that, man, he's this, this is not a ball player. This guy's never played ball. I'm not exactly sure how functional he is on the ball field. The, uh, and what were we talking about? Why did I mention that? Uh... Oh, throwing the ball or riding a bike. Okay. Anyway, so you can remember these things. You remember how to do them. You remember how to step forward. Uh, you, you, you remember when to release the ball. And here Mark Ruffalo was taking a step and then kind of throwing the ball. I mean, it was just really awkward looking. There have been uh, some interesting findings looking at the effects of, of the sex hormones and memory. 
Dealing with animal studies, researchers have discovered that increased estrogen levels, as with birth control pills and hormone replacement therapy, it decreases a woman's special reference memory, memory for location and space. Looking at male subjects, they found that when they increased testosterone, they increased their special re reference memory. Of course, you wouldn't want to give a woman... An, an older woman testosterone just to increase her spatial reference memory that would make her grow even more hairs out of her chin. Uh, many parents, especially some women, so strongly identify with their mothering role that when their last child finally leaves the house, they may suffer from bouts of loneliness and feelings of worthlessness because of their role, because their role has changed from the center of their children's lives to the periphery. And this is known as the empty nest syndrome. Fathers also may suffer from empty nest in that they may regret not having spent more time with their children. Do opposites attract? Uh, not usually. Most people fall in love with and marry someone much like themselves. This is known as assort assortative mating. In fact, people who are about equally attractive are the most likely to develop close relationships. Lovers often resemble each other in physical appearance, attractiveness, mental health, physical health, intelligence, popularity, and warmth. They are likely to be similar in degree to which their parents are happy as individuals and as couples. And here we go to happy couples. Couples tend to be similar as their socioeconomic status, race, religion, education, and income. They often have similar temperaments. They often have similar interests. Researchers have found that people are usually more cognizant of why a failed relationship dissolved than why they got together in the first place, even though that should be equally important. And as you can see, we're talking about beauty here. We're talking about people that look alike. I want you to notice their eyebrows. Okay. Her eyebrows are the same color as his eyebrows, even though her hair is blonde. You can see she dyes it. She dyes it! And here's another situation. There we go. Look at his eyebrows and her eyebrows. If she didn't dye her hair blonde, it would be just about the same color. And, of course, these are two Koreans. And here, once again... Two people with the same color hair. And she her hair's a little bit darker than his. And here we go. <clears throat> same color hair. And if we look at her, the eyebrows. Well, you can't really see his eyebrows. About the same color. And there we go. Celebrities. Of course, these two weren't together anymore. Same color hair. And Brad and, and Angelina, who aren't together anymore either. But, as you can see, their hair color is almost exactly the same. Oh, same color of hair? Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to get at. <clears throat> so people marry people with the same color hair that they have. Uh, I have two wives, and, and uh, well, all, all, all of my wives, both of my wives have had the same color hair as me. Later years, the ability of older people, when I... Oh, I won't go into that. Later years, the ability of older couples to handle the ups and downs of marriage results from mutual supportiveness, intimacy, both sexual and emotional, uh, interdependence, sharing of tasks and resources, the partner's sense of belonging to each other. In the United States, the average age of grandparents at first grandchild is 50 for women and 52 for men. I had my first grandchild when I in, uh, in 2012. And I was, what, that's 51, 63, so I was, I was old. Minorities uh, uh, usually achieve grandparenthood at a younger age than, uh, than whites do. 75% of older Americans are grandparents. 40% uh, are great-grandparents. Families are getting smaller. They are about a third as large as they were at the turn of the 20th century. In developing countries, the role of the grandparent is one of the counselor and financial benefactor. In the United States, grandparents often act as teacher, caretaker, role model, 
negotiator, but this is only about 15% of grandparents. Grandparenthood involved grandparents about represents only about 15% 15% of grandparents. Uh, they're involved to the extent of disciplining or correcting their grandchildren. They give advice. They discuss the child's problems. They're consulted on important decisions concerning the child. Um, exchanges uh, are help with uh, errands and chores. They uh, they exchange help with their their uh, with their children. Uh, I took my grandson to soccer practice last night. My my wife took him to soccer practice on Wednesday night. So we're involve grandparents. As a matter of fact, uh, my daughter was living in Florida and she loved Florida. She liked going to the beach and, you know, that was, it fit her lifestyle. And, and she moved up here because she wasn't getting any support down there and she was having problems um, taking care of her, her son. So she came up here uh, to Iowa so that we could help her. And of course, we help her whenever we can. This weekend, I'm going to, uh, he has a soccer tournament in uh, outside of Des Moines, and I'm going to his soccer tournament this weekend. So so there you go. I fed him last night. What did he want to eat? He wanted to eat Mexican food. Usually the night before he went to Hoo Hut, he went to, had Mongolian barbecue. He likes to eat the noodles. He likes the Chinese noodles. <clears throat> so he's, he's, a, he's a cool kid. He's doing okay. <clears throat> Younger grandparents, those who see their grandchildren almost every day, and those who have a close relationship with the child's mother, are more likely to be involved. Grandparenting styles may differ with different grandchildren and at times in, ch in a child's life. The most involved years tend to be when the grandchildren are pre-adolescent. One researcher from the 80s sees grandparents as family watchdogs. They often stay on the fringes of their children and grandchildren's lives, rarely playing an impact role unless there is a need. In a crisis, they will stop, uh, step in with financial or emotional support. One study in 1987 found that 14% of preschool children were under the care of grandparents during the daytime. Grandmothers tend to have a closer, warmer relationship than grandfathers with their grandchildren and to serve more often as a surrogate parent. The mother's parents uh, tend to be, more, uh, to be closer than the father's parents and are more likely to become involved in a crisis. Grandmothers tend to be more satisfied with grandparenting than grandfathers are, though grandfathers tend to be warmer to their grandchildren than they were to their children. Many feel that it is a second chance to do a better job at parenting than they did with their own children. 7% of children in the United States live in households headed by a grandparent. One third of these children have no parent present in the household. In some low-income areas of the United States, an estimated 30 to 50% of children are living in kinship care, living in households with grandparents or other relatives without their parents. Many of these children may have behavioral or learning problems due to a parent's abuse of alcohol or drugs. 68% of grandparent caregivers are white. 29% are black. 93% of single grandparent caregivers are women. 40% of grandparent caregivers are poor or just above the poverty level. Two-thirds of custodial, custodial grandparents report a greater sense of purpose in life. Often the age difference between the grandparents and the grandchildren can be a barrier between them. They may feel anger or guilt for raising children who do not take care of their own children. They may feel that it shows they themselves have somehow failed as parents. Age discrimination refers to denying someone a job or promotion solely on the basis of age. The Age Discrimination Employment Act of 1986 protects workers over 40. This law states that people must be hired based on ability rather than age. This law will not allow employers to hire or fire using age as their sole criteria. <clears throat> the law also keeps employers from segregating or classifying employees using age as the basis for this classification. Researchers show that the idea of retirement is not universally accepted. 
this response is, uh, the responses fall into three categories. Those who are so attached to their work that they can cannot imagine retiring, and that's where I am. I can't imagine retiring. Those who were looking forward to retirement as an opportunity to do things they hadn't done before. That's not me. Those that have mixed feelings or hadn't yet thought much about retirement, and that's obviously me as well. <clears throat> In Germany, only 3% of older adults still work. In Japan, the percentage of older adults still working is 28%. In the United States, 16% of older men and 8% of older women are still in the workforce. And that's me. And it was Wilson until last year. <laughs> in 1900, 67% of men over 65 were still in the workforce. In 1950, 50% of the men over 65 were still in the workforce. Individuals who continue working tend to be better educated than individuals who retire and tend to be in good health. Many people finance their retirement in various ways. Social insurance, such as Social Security, universal pensions, some countries automatically give each retired individual a pension, voluntary pension plans, most companies in the United States and, and Britain are allowed tax deferments to maintain a pension fund and uh, provident funds. Similar to Social Security, but people get it all in one lump sum after they retire. And in the United States, of course, we have Social Security and most companies maintain a voluntary pension plans. A lot of times, they're 401ks. While many people do prepare for retirement, just under half don't even think about it. But even the individuals who plan tend to aim too low. Savings programs need to be maintained at higher levels than most people are maintaining them. What do people do after retirement? Many maintain supplemental paid jobs. People who were self-employed before retirement tended to work at least part-time after retirement. Volunteerism, one out of three people over 75 do volunteer work. That's what my wife does. 40% of all retired people do volunteer work. Leisure, uh, people tend to find a focus after retirement. Uh, some people maintain a family-focused lifestyle that means moving closer to grandchildren. Some people maintain a serious leisure where they must maintain skill and concentration in their endeavors. About 11% of U.S. retired people live in poverty. This is down from 35% in 1959, and the vast majority before Franklin Roosevelt passed the Social Security Act. I'm trying to see what that, I think that's, Ger she's German. I think that's a German bill, a Deutschmark. After retirement, uh, age often dictates uh, poor health, but the vast majority of people are fairly healthy, both mentally and physically, until just before they retire. Erickson's seventh crisis occurs at least by the, the beginning of middle adulthood and lasts until retirement. And if you remember what Erickson's seventh crisis was, it was generativity versus stagnation. The crisis involves whether the individual will guide the next generation or whether they will focus on their own needs. This crisis is often resolved as soon as the individual decides to have and raise a family. People who put off relationships and a family are often too self-absorbed to care about generativity. In 1968, Robert Peck looked at Erickson's idea of generativity and expanded on how people change their focus as they enter middle age. Valuing wisdom instead of physical powers, socializing instead of sexualizing human relationships, Concentrating on many people rather than investing all of one's time on one individual. Mental flexibility instead of mental rigidity. And that is how Peck sees generativity. And that is the end of the chapter. So we're going to stop right here. We'll tackle chapter 12 uh, next time.